Good morning. Today is the third Sunday of Lent. Last week you heard from Michael. Michael's my husband. Um, you can decide later if he's my better half or I'm his. <laughs> you heard from Michael last week and he shared with you about the Good Shepherd, the character and the goodness of God, and he also shared what it meant to live a life that is drawn versus driven. For me, living into that invitation ultimately looks like surrender. When we live a driven life, we may find ourselves grasping for control, reaching and stretching and pulling for more control. This is a rigid and difficult way to live. But when we position ourselves to live as we are drawn by the movement of the Holy Spirit, we live with arms open so that we can move freely as we are drawn. There is no space for grasping for control, clinging to control. We do not cling to our own plans or our own ideas, our own desires or determined wills. We live a life in a posture of surrender to God's plan and his desires for us. As I make myself available to God this Lenten season, the message I hear over and over is surrender. Surrender sounds like a good message, a good mantra for Lent, doesn't it? As we journey with Jesus to the cross, to his full surrender to God, we too are called to surrender. A call to surrender during Lent often looks like a call to simplicity, to prayer, to fasting, a call to repentance, emptying of ourselves in order to be filled with God. We recognize our weakness and God's strength. We recognize that we don't necessarily know what we need, but God in His goodness does. And with all of these thoughts, I am drawn to think about the prayer that Jesus taught us and his disciples. Nestled right in the middle of Jesus' Sermon on the Hill, Jesus teaches us to pray. Right at the center of all that we should know about God and his character and his kingdom and how to live in his kingdom is prayer. The center of his kingdom is prayer, and we must learn to integrate it into our practice of kingdom living. And so, Jesus offers us this as a foundation of the prayer life. Um, the introduction of prayer and the continuing basis of all other prayers. It is enduring framework for all praying. So, it is not the only way to pray. It is not just a formula for prayer. Um, but with this prayer, Jesus is inviting us to turn to our Father to discover who God is and who we are. Jesus teaches us, he invites us to pray in Matthew 6, 5 through 13. Let's read together. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. This, then, is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
I have a confession to make. Um, when I was younger, I think I had a misconception about this prayer or any other prayer that felt like um, it was pre-written or um, something you could memorize. As I was developing my own personal relationship with God, I was also learning to pray. I was using my own words and my own thoughts and my own emotions as I prayed. So when I thought of prayers that were memorized or felt rehearsed, I was turned off. They felt insincere to me. I wanted my words to be fresh and new to that moment from my heart. But I did not truly understand this prayer that, yes, usually is memorized. I did not understand the beauty and depth of the words, the intentionality of Jesus as he taught us to pray. Many of you may have heard pastors teach on this passage, but it is always a helpful reminder to me at least to come back to the teaching of Jesus on prayer. So let's go ahead and dig in. The prayer begins, Our Father who art in heaven. Beginning this prayer by calling out to our Father, Jesus, invites us into an intimate communion with God. He is inviting us into a warm and trusting relationship. Jesus reveals that our relationship with God is that of a child to a father. God is our Father. You are a child of God. I am a child of God. We are the children of God. Praying in this way, our Father in Heaven, reminds us that we are not only children, we are sons and daughters. We are brothers and sisters. And so, in this prayer, there is comfort in knowing that God is our Father and that we are not alone. As Jesus invites us to begin our prayer in this way, he is inviting us to remember our identity. Every time we come before God, we are reminded of our identity when we pray this way. Naming God as Father demonstrates the character of God but it also reveals and reminds us who we are and what, how we find our identity in God. Jesus began his public ministry by receiving his identity from God. Before he did anything in his public ministry, he was given his identity. Remember, Jesus was baptized, he came up out of the water, and God said, You are my son, with you I am well pleased. So to me, this is a reminder that when we come to God, we do not begin by listing our qualifications to come before Him, reasons we believe we deserve an audience with God. We don't have to come saying, we've done all of this, this is why we deserve to come before you. No, we come to our Father as His children our Father who art in heaven. A Father in heaven reminds us of his greatness and of his nearness. <clears throat> in heaven, he is powerful and great and majestic, but he is a Father who is close and near and who walks with us. He is intimate and near. And we begin our prayer addressing God in this tender, intimate, loving way. Hallowed be thy name means God's name should be hallowed. It should be revered and honored in us. God's name is holiness itself. So by hallowing, we are not making holy, but asking that his holiness truly be known in us that we may honor, love, and fear him. We ask for what is already holy to be present and to remain eternally. So, we have been taught to begin our prayer by naming God as Father and remembering our identity as his children. We name God holy and we desire 
His holiness be made known in us. And next we name God King, and we ask for his lordship to reign in our lives. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Praying for God's kingdom to come is recognizing that God's kingdom has already come and is yet to come. The kingdom has already become because Jesus has taken on flesh and has walked among us and given us hope. And the kingdom is yet to come. That is the hope that Jesus gives us. Jesus announces the coming of the kingdom. And so we ask God to be Lord, of our, Lord over our lives and to change our hearts to a position that is ready for him to work and to move in us. We are asking to be set aside that his kingdom may come quickly. We are asking for all other kingdoms to be displaced or brought under God's rule so that we may truly receive him as King and Lord of our lives. And so naturally, we ask God's will to be done. In this, we are declaring confidence that what he has already done and we are trusting his will for the future. We are saying, I believe in you, I hope in you, I love you, may your will for good be fulfilled in me. We are saying yes to God. This all sounds like surrender to me, declaring God as Father, as Holy, as Lord of our lives, desiring His goodness, His nearness, His holiness, and His will in our lives. This sounds like a prayer that makes room for more of God and less of me. What an excellent way to begin our prayer. We have been invited to start our prayer focusing on proclaiming God's goodness and power and might. We are confident, we are confident in his personalized care for us, confident in his holy and almighty power, and we are invited to trust him as Lord of our lives. And then we are invited to petition for our needs, our needs for daily bread, for forgiveness, and deliverance from evil. Let me show you how I believe the focus in, on God is, um, uh, the focus on God in the beginning is leading us to petition these particular needs. We pray to God as Father, as Holy, and as Lord, and then we ask for bread, for forgiveness, and for deliverance. I'm a visual person, so as I have read and studied this prayer, an image comes to my mind, and um, I imagine these specific names aligning with each specific request that we are invited to ask of God. So when we see God as Father, we are invited to ask for our daily bread. And when we name God as holy, we are invited to ask for God's forgiveness. And when we name God as Lord, we are invited to ask God for deliverance from evil. And so I believe that each name we declare of God in the first half of the prayer directly correlates with each of the requests in the second half of the prayer. And so the prayer continues, and we are taught to pray, Give us this day our daily bread. This brief and simple request is actually quite weighty. Give us this day our daily bread. The emphasis on provision today is for what we need today. This is because God is always present today, no matter what day it is. My children do not ask me for breakfast today and save a little for tomorrow or the next day. They don't do this because they trust that I will be present tomorrow and the day after that to meet the needs for those days. 
And so their focus is only on asking what they need for today, in this moment. And this is how Jesus teaches us to think and pray for our needs. We named God as our Father, and we relate to Him, and we make our request as His children, as child to parent. God as Father is provider, the one who provides for our daily needs. Just as a father longs to provide for his children, so God longs to provide. The Bible often speaks of God's desire to pour out his blessings on us if only we will ask and trust in him to meet all of our needs. But we must trust that he is present always and focus on the reality that naming God as Father is naming Him as our provider for today, every day. This is such a powerful reminder to me. How often are we tempted to worry about the future, whether that something is next week or many years down the road? Um, I am reminded in the way Jesus teaches us to pray that there is a beautiful surrender in letting go and living as a child, asking today for what we need today and tomorrow for what we need tomorrow. How wonderful that Jesus teaches us to pray in a way that reminds us to surrender each time we come before God. Continuing with the posture of surrender, we are taught to pray Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Forgiveness, it is a difficult task. It is difficult to forgive. It doesn't seem to come naturally. The struggle to forgive makes me think of the same image um, of grasping for control, these tightly clenched fists. Um, we ask to be forgiven but we hold on to the debts against us. With, fist, with fists clenched tightly, we have the control, right? But Jesus brings us right back to this posture of surrender. We are to open our arms wide to receive God's forgiveness and also to give forgiveness. This is difficult, but there is one condition. You will be able to forgive if you have had the grace and the feeling of forgiveness. Only the person who feels forgiven is capable of forgiving. I forgive because I first have been forgiven. So I see this parallel in naming God as holy and inviting his holiness to dwell among us, to dwell with us, and the request to forgive us and wipe out the evil in us while helping us to forgive. Only a holy God makes it possible for forgiveness and redemption. There can be no pride in asking for forgiveness. We must understand that we are sinful, and that requires God's amazing forgiveness through Christ's blood. As Ephesians 1.4 says, Christ chose us to be his holy people, people without blame before him. As we receive the forgiveness of God and live as forgiven people who also forgive, we are living as people who revere and honor God's holy name and present a testimony that is pure. Paul explains it to the Colossians like this. In Colossians 1.22, he says, But now God has made you his friends again. He did this through Christ's death in the body so that he might bring you into God's presence as people who are holy, with no wrong, and with nothing of which God can judge you guilty. So as we invite God's holiness among us, we also ask to be made holy. 
with no blame and nothing of which to be judged guilty. God's pardon is our purification. Finally, Jesus teaches us to pray and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Another translation of lead us not into temptation is do not, deban do not abandon us to temptation or when Satan leads me into temptation, please God, give me a hand, give me your hand, deliver me from Satan. The word temptation here is referring mostly to the temptation that comes from trial and testing. Trials always cause us to be tempted. And so we are confessing our weakness and God's strength. And we are asking for God's help. As we prayed earlier for God's kingdom and will, we were trusting him and naming him as Lord of our lives. In that, we are saying that we need God to be in control. And so I see the parallel between our need for God as Lord of our lives with the need for him to offer his strength in our weakness and save us in the midst of temptation. Second Thessalonians 3.3 3 says, But the Lord is faithful and will give you strength and will protect you from the evil one. God ruling in the lives of his people is deliverance from evil. The Lord God is powerful against the evil one. So as you may see now, naming God as Father, as Holy, and as Lord gives us the confidence in his character that leads us to pray for and to request our daily provisions, our forgiveness, and deliverance from evil. I believe Jesus taught us to pray in a manner of making room for God and finding our identity in him, and then being propelled into a life of obedience by asking for his provision and forgiveness and deliverance in our lives. The order here matters. Jesus did not invite us to obedience first. In fact, he led into this prayer teaching by saying quite the opposite. He said that we are not to make prayer a show to impress others or to use many as many words as we can string together in order to get God's attention. Rather, we pray from our heart. Jesus invited us to first address God as our Father and to recognize his greatness and goodness in our lives. And from that, we are drawn into a life of obedience and surrender. So let us take the posture of surrender that Jesus draws us into as he teaches us to pray, and let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.